In this video, I want to talk about how we go about testing for endogeneity of a given variable within our regression. And the idea here is that we're going to include in our structural equation one suspected endogenous variable x and one variable which we know to be exogenous, which I'm going to call z1, as well as our error epsilon. So you might think a way we could go about testing for whether or not x is exogenous or not, or whether it's endogenous rather, might be to say, well, what's the covariance between x and epsilon? And is it the case that it doesn't equal zero? Well, that would be fine if we actually knew what epsilon was, but when we sort of use the estimated value of epsilon, which we get from running this regression, it's actually completely wrong. We can't use that as a measure of actually testing for whether or not x is endogenous because of the fact that the estimated errors in these circumstances, if x is endogenous, will be incorrect. So this method at the top here doesn't actually lead to anything. Another method we could use would be to say, well, let's compare the values of two-stage least squares with those of least squares. Because if they are the same, then that's suggestive that x is exogenous, because by estimating it via two-stage least squares, I actually haven't changed my parameter estimate for beta at all. Uh, whereas if we actually had the case where beta two-stage least squares or beta hat two-stage least squares rather doesn't equal beta hat least squares, then in those circumstances, we would conclude that the variable x is endogenous. But notice that both of these sort of tests which I've spoken about here, they're sort of rules of thumb. I haven't been particularly concrete as to how we'd actually go about testing it. It just might be a way of practically testing about whether we need to worry about endogeneity. If we wanted an explicit form of a test for endogeneity, what we can actually do is we can sort of do kind of what is similar to what I've mentioned over here, but we sort of need to make it a little bit more concrete. So the idea here is that in my first stage, what I do is I do a regression of x on delta naught and delta one times z1 plus delta two times z2 plus delta three times z3. And also from this regression, I have some sort of error, which I'm going to call V. And notice here that Z2 and Z3 are the two instruments which I'm using for X, because Z1 is already contained within our structural equation. So the idea within this first stage is what we then do is we use our estimated values of delta naught through delta 3 to come up with estimated values of V, the error from this first stage. So why are we doing that? Well, this sort of term here, which I'm sort of drawing lines around here, can be thought about as the sort of variance in x, which is due to the exogenous variables, z1 through z3, whereas v hat, or v, you can think about as being due to the sort of endogenous part of x, if it exists, that is. So if there was a way of testing for significance of this endogenous part of x in this structure equation up here, then that might be a way of testing for whether or not x is endogenous. And as it turns out, that's exactly what we do. So essentially what we do is we run a regression of y on our original endogenous variable x. We also include our exogenous variable in the structural relationship z1 as well as our estimate of v, which we call v hat. And then what we do in the situation where we have a single explanatory endogenous variable is that we then test for significance of gamma naught. Because if gamma naught is statistically different from zero, so we conclude that gamma naught is greater than zero, then that is suggestive of some part of x, which we call v or v hat, is actually endogenous. Whereas if we conclude under the sort of null hypothesis, we, we cannot reject the null hypothesis, rather, that gamma naught equals naught, then we cannot reject the null hypothesis that x is exogenous. Okay, so that's the case for a single explanatory endogenous variable. How do we go about doing this for multiple explanatory endogenous variables? Well, it's much the same. Essentially, if we had two suspected endogenous variables, x1 and x2, then in our first stage we would just come up with two sort of estimates of the endogenous parts of each of those variables, v1 hat and v2 hat, 
And then we would include both of these estimates in our structural equation. And then what we could do then is rather than doing a t-test, we could do an f-test for significance of both of these two variables, in which case we'd be testing for joint um, endogeneity of x1 and x2. Another thing I want to talk about here is if we actually do include our estimated errors from our first stage regression in our structural equation, so we include v hat, then it turns out that b beta 1 hat for least squares in this structural equation and beta 2 hat least squares in the structural equation actually coincide exactly with that which is obtained from two stage least squares. And the reason for that are quite simple really, because essentially, just like we're doing in two stage least squares, we are taking into account this sort of endogenous part of x, and we are accounting for it explicitly in our regression. In two stage least squares, we, we do that by including x hat, and because x hat only contains that variance of x which is exogenous, that is okay. But here, another way of doing that is just by including all the parts of x which are endogenous. And by taking into account of that, essentially we're parceling out the, the effect of x which is endogenous, and hence the least squares estimates from this structure equation should actually be okay, they will be consistent. So in these circumstances, beta hat least squares on this sort of altered structure equation will be consistent, just as will be two stage least squares. They are essentially one and the same. And I just wanted to add a last note, which is the fact that I know I mentioned in earlier videos that there is no simple test for endogeneity. And the reason for that is because in order to carry out this test, we already required two exogenous variables, or oh, sorry, we only required one of those exogenous variables, but we still required that exogenous variable. In a lot of circumstances, we won't actually be able to find an exogenous variable, so we won't actually be able to carry out this test for endogeneity. So that's why, as opposed to the test for heteroscedasticity or the test for serial correlation, there is no particularly simple test for endogeneity because it already requires that we have some instrument, which we may or may not have.